Hey everybody, this is Tracy here with another edition of A View from Tracy's Point. And as you guys know, I'm currently working on trying to break down all the videos that I did for R. Kelly's Eastern District of New York case, which starts, um, the appeal or argument starts on tomorrow. So just trying to make these videos much shorter so you guys can get more information on what the appeal is all about. Because remember, the oral arguments only last about 10 or 15 minutes, although there were hundreds of pages of documents that were submitted that the justices will be reviewing as they make their decision. And so I just made a, dropped a video that is about the RICO case and whether or not there was an enterprise. And so Jennifer Bajin is stating that there wasn't an enterprise to support the RICO charge, that these were just employees of Mr. Kelly's. And so as I was reviewing to see what I wanted to do next, what information I wanted to share, I came across a portion where she actually outlines who the employees were that the government is saying was the enterprise that she's arguing were merely just employees doing their jobs. And so this should only take about a few minutes for you to run through who these eight people were that the government is trying to peg as the quote unquote enterprise that Jennifer Bonjean is saying did not exist. Okay, so it should only take a few minutes for you to get through this, but I did want to drop this in in case you guys were wondering, okay, well, who were the employees? Okay, here we go. One, Demetrius Smith. Um, Demetrius Smith, friend and personal assistant with for the defendant with uh, 1984 to 1994. Um, Smith met defendant as a teenager when he was still attending high school and singing in subways in the mid 1980s. Um, Smith was a Smith was first a friend and mentor to the defendant, and then began working as his personal assistant when defendant received his first record deal in 1988. Or 1989. Smith worked off and on for defendant as a personal assistant around until around 1994. Smith's responsibilities included assisting the defendant in things he needed and with scheduling. Smith testified that defendant met Aaliyah through his manager Barry Hankerson who was Aaliyah's uncle. Um, Smith testified that from his perspective his perspective, their relationship was strictly about music and that he never saw defendant take Aaliyah out by herself. Smith did concede there were short periods of time when defendant might be alone with Aaliyah. There were times when he thought defendant and Aaliyah were overly playful or too friendly and he asked defendant if he was messing with Aaliyah to which defendant always responded no. Um, Smith raised those concerns a few times but only learned that the relationship was more than platonic in 1994 with number two um, Anthony Navarro. Anthony Navarro worked as a sound engineer in defendant's studio for two and a half years. Navarro understood it was entry-level position and would include such duties as cleaning, doing food runs, and driving guests around. Navarro testified that numerous people came through the studio, including different girlfriends of the defendant. One of his responsibilities was to drive the girlfriends where they needed to go. He was instructed not to speak with defendant's guests. Navarro explained that defendant's guests were generally required to ask permission if they wanted things or wanted to order food and they were not permitted to wander the studio or defendant's home unaccompanied. Sometimes these guests would stay at the studio for an extended period of time but could leave if they wanted to. Navarro did not know the details of why any female guests visited. Oops. Click too many times. Let's get back up here. Okay. 
Navarro never picked up female guests who appeared to be underage. They appeared to be around his age in their early 20s. Navarro had never seen defendant engaging in sexual activity in his home or in his studio. Navarro went on tour with the defendant and observed that invites would be distributed to attendees for after parties. Sometimes defendant's phone number would be on the invites. At times, he would see defendant's phone number distributed to people at the mall or at a restaurant. Navarro never saw underage girls backstage. Navarro recalled that Identifications were checked before people could go backstage, but he could not recall whether people had to be 18 or 21. Three, Tom Arnold, runner studio manager from 1998 to 2011. Oh, let me go back up because I don't think I read. Um, Anthony Navarro was a runner and sound engineer from 2007 to 2009. Okay, so Tom Arnold, runner studio manager from 1998 to 2011. Tom Arnold worked for defendant from 1998 to 2011. He started as a runner and eventually became his studio manager and road manager. One of Arnold's responsibilities working for defendant was to provide transportation to his guests, which could include men with whom defendant played basketball, a musician, and his female guests. If defendant wanted Arnold to transport a guest somewhere, defendant would tell him directly or someone with defendant would make the request. Arnold testified that the protocol for driving guests from one location to another was to open the door for them, turn the rearview mirror up, and then turn the radio on to a reasonable volume. Arnold understood that turning the rearview mirror up was to avoid eye contact with defendant's female guests and to ensure their privacy. Guests at the studio were required to sign confidentiality agreements that prohibited guests from recording or taking photographs. Staff would either take Polaroid photos of guests or copy their identification to confirm the identity of the person signing the confidentiality agreement. Okay, the policy of having studio guests sign confidentiality agreements originated with defendant's business manager and lawyer. Um, Arnold generally had no interactions with the defendant's female guests. If a guest in the studio was hungry, they would call the front desk and Arnold would arrange to get them food with petty cash that was at the reception area. If a guest wanted to move from one location to the studio to another, Arnold would get permission to escort the guest. If a guest wanted to speak with the defendant, Arnold would relay the message to the defendant. Arnold explained that generally guests would not be able to roam defendant's studio and home freely, but would ask for permission to go from one part of the studio to another. Arnold testified that there were instances when he would provide defendant's phone number to a woman, not normally in a concert setting, but an after party or at a club or possibly at the mall. There were also other num I'm sorry, other members of the entourage who would give women defendant's phone number. Underage people were not permitted backstage and identifications were checked to ensure that um, Arnold did not testify that he provided defendant's phone number to any woman under age. Arnold testified that he sometimes arranged travel for defendant's female guests until they began using a professional travel company. Arnold would obtain the guest identification to arrange their travel. Arnold did not testify that he ever booked travel for an underage female guest. For Suzette and Aliciette, a-L-E-S-I-E-T-T, -E -T -T, Alizette Mayweather, personal assistant um, in 2016. Um, Suzette and Alice, child, this the spelling just don't even make no sense to me. What did we say this was? Is it Alizette? Suzette and Alizette? I don't know. Uh, worked as personal assistants for the defendant. Suzette worked for a defendant between October 2015 and February 2017. And then A, I'm going to call her AZ. 
<laughs> work for the defendant between late 2015 to June 2016. Their job responsibilities were to tend to anything he needed, running errands, grocery shopping, taking care of laundry, arranging accommodations for guests, female and male, coming into town and booking airfare. Um, Suzette and her sister testified that defendant had several living girlfriends during this period of time. They testified that defendant was controlling of his girlfriends, expected them to follow certain rules, dress down in baggy clothes, and suspected he slapped or spanked them previously. On a couple of occasions, the sisters expressed concern amongst themselves about defendant's mistreatment of Azriel. The sisters denied that they took any action at any time to assist defendant in procuring girls or women. Number five, Diane, Diana Copeland, um, personal assistant, executive assistant intermittently from 2005 to 2018. Copeland began working for the defendant in 2004 or 2005 as a personal assistant and worked off and on for the defendant until 2018. Her responsibilities were largely household in the beginning, um, tending to housekeepers and nannies and making sure they were paid. Later on, Copeland would do administrative jobs like answering phones, maintaining defendant's schedule, and tending to defendant's guests, which could be anyone from a record label executive to a personal guest. Copeland would make hotel and travel arrangements for the defendant, his entourage, and his girlfriends. Copeland would sometimes carry defendant's backpack, but she never went through it. She did see an iPad in one of the backpacks once. During her last stint of employment with the defendant, one of Copeland's responsibilities was to help him get control of his finances. Defendant had difficulties reading and writing. He had no control over his bank accounts, did not even know his social security number, and did not know where his royalties were going. Defendant instituted rules for guests on his property, namely to knock before entering a room and not to roam around the property unsupervised. These rules apply to anyone everyone and were actually initiated by his wife when she lived on the property. Copeland acknowledged that defendant's girlfriends also followed defendant's rules to wear baggy clothing and not to attract, I'm sorry, not to interact with other men in public. Defendant had girlfriends who stayed at his properties sometimes for extended periods of time. Some girlfriends lived in defendant's home while others did not. They were free to leave if they wanted to. Copeland never attempted to stop any of defendant's girlfriends from leaving his property. Defendant never asked Copeland to recruit women for him, nor did she ever hear him ask any other employee to recruit women for him. Copeland never saw defendant attempt to prevent any woman from leaving his home. She never saw defendant lock any of his girlfriends in a room, and he never asked for her to confine any of his girlfriends. Defendant's girlfriends had constant access to food and assistance to help them with anything they wanted. Six, Nicholas Williams. I don't remember Nicholas. Uh, Williams worked for, and he was an intern and runner in 2003. Nicholas uh, Williams worked for the defendant for a year in 2003 when he was 19 years old. He described the environment as hostile work environment and was disappointed that was not able to use, okay, I think she meant that he was not able to use the audio equipment. I think I do kind of remember him. Is he one of the people that sued for the bank wages or something? Or was that the Navarro guy? Um, anyway, different types of people visited defendant at the studio, ranging from professional artists, musicians, actors, with whom he was doing projects, personal trainer, some of his entourage, and female guests. Williams noticed that defendant's female guests at the studio were young. Williams was instructed not to interact with the female guests. 7. Cheryl Mike, executive assistant from 2014 to 2015. And for those of you who don't know, Cheryl Mike is the mother of uh, London on the Tracks, who is a um, music producer. 
So Mike, um, M-A-C-K, I know y'all get mad, y'all say I be saying Mike, like M-I-K-E, but it's my southern drawl, okay? So, um, anyway, she met Defendant in 2005 when she was working as a talent manager in the industry. She reconnected with Defendant in 2013 through another record executive and began working as Defendant's executive assistant in 2014. She managed Defendant's calendar and worked on projects with him. She also arranged travel for his guests and entourage. Um, Cheryl would arrange travel as requested by the defendant and use the company credit card to book necessary reservations. Um, she used a company known as Preferred Travel to make most reservations. Um, she was prohibited from socializing with defendant's guests. Um, Cheryl received a text message from Azrael in April 2015 asking her to book travel arrangements to California for Azriel, which she did. Um, she later met Jane or Azriel in the lobby of the Mandalay Bay Hotel in Las Vegas, where she was checking into her hotel room. She also saw Azriel in Kelly's dressing room at a venue in Connecticut where he was performing. She was there with several other individuals, but eventually she left when Kelly began massaging Azriel's leg because it made her feel uncomfortable. Um, she said she quit the following day. Yeah, right, girl. Okay, so that is it uh, as far as who they are claiming, I guess, as part of the enterprise. Even though none of these people were charged as part of this RICO case. And if you want to learn more about Cheryl Mike and what she actually did um, for Mr. Kelly, I have a series of videos on Azriel Clary. It's an, a text message exchange between her and her mother. And I believe it's it took me about five videos to read all of these text messages. It was like 175 pages of text message, text messages between Azrael and her mom. But Cheryl Mack plays an integral part in what was going on in these text messages. And you'll see exactly what her job was and how if there really was something, you know, bad going on, she would have known because she was pretty much Azriel's primary contact um, for a certain period of time before she claimed that she got upset and quit. So anyway, let's go ahead and wrap this up and I will be back shortly with another segment of what will be covered in the Eastern District of New York appeal with the Eastern District of New York versus um, Robert Sylvester Kelly. Please don't forget to like, share, and comment on the video because that helps with the engagement and to get the video seen by others. Okay, talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.